Anyway, we had uh, so many people call us uh, about what was going on in their churches. And uh, we didn't do it for that reason. We did it to make sure people know what the gospel is all about. So um, it's going to be a little rough if you uh, don't have a church that's preaching the right message. So I wanted you to know that on the back table, book table back there, is our brochures already done fresh. Just, just printed last week for our conference in July in Abbotsford, British Columbia. It's all there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Looks like a good, great conference. Always is. Yeah, amen. Anyway, they're back there, and they're free. Always get free things. I want to tell you about two things. One, we do have a monthly newsletter, and those are back there, and there's a little form inside. Just fill it out, leave it with the folks there, and we'll see that you get it free, wherever you'd like us to send it. It focuses on Israel and Bible prophecy. There are articles you're free to use, of course. We also have articles on our website. Uh, our website is davidhucking.org. Now, I tell you that for a reason. In addition to our monthly newsletter, we have a controversial e-letter that comes every week on Sunday. You have to do this. I can't do it for you. Go to davidhawking.org, and on our front page website, on the right, you'll find HFT Connect. HFT standing for Hope for Today. And all you have to do is put in your email. That's all we need. And uh, it'll come to your home or wherever you want it, where you get your email. Now, this one is a little more controversial. Uh, people seem to enjoy it and are getting news that you don't get anywhere else. That's the unfortunate thing about news today, even Christian news sites. Um, I should tell you that uh, people have been quite amazed at what we write about. Uh, they warn me regularly, you know, you better be careful, somebody's going to shoot you. That's all right, absent from the body, present with the Lord. What's the big deal? I've been in Islamic jails before, so I know they're not real pleasant. But the fact is that we need to stand up for what the Bible says and not be intimidated or afraid. It's like going to a school. I was asked to speak at a major high school, baccalaureate. And the guy before I went out, he said, well, now you know you can't say anything about Jesus. I said, then why in the world did you ask me to come? So I got up in front of all those students and I said, I understand we're not supposed to mention Jesus. So when I count to three, you students do what you want to do. One, two, three. And they all yelled out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I loved it, every minute of it. They had a concert that week by a Christian group and they told them, you can play but you can't mention Jesus. And if he's mentioned in your song, you've got to get rid of him. So they were playing all week long, and it's a major high school, some 5,000. So they were out on the athletic field during the lunch hour playing, and uh, they had loudspeakers on and went everywhere for blocks. <laughs> well, one of the guys accidentally introducing a song mentioned Jesus, and out from the administration building comes this little vice principal on his little golf cart, riding in a... He came out and he started yelling at the students and said, I told you, you can't mention the word you know. You know what I'm talking about. And um, a kid who is in his high school for the first time, he blew his stack. He's kind of a nerd. You know, he's not, he's not athletic. He's not built big. He's just a little skinny kid with real thick glasses. He blew his stack. He went over to the vice principal and he says, I've had it! You can mention every satanic cult in our school and all the stupid religious people in the world, but we can't mention Jesus? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going along with it anymore. And I, he turned to the crowd of kids and he said, Jesus, Jesus! 
And the next day in the Orange County Register is a picture of the vice president on his golf cart going as fast as he can with about a thousand kids running after him yelling, Jesus. Hey, wake up. We don't need to sit down and back off. What are you talking about? You think Islam is? Oh, no, they're scared of them. It's about time we Christians learn how to speak up. I was in a barber shop, and I had, you know, that white thing on, whatever, and barbers cutting my hair, and this guy is in there. He, the barber shop is full of, of men, and it, this guy starts taking off on Jesus, tearing into him, calling him names and everything. And I knew the barber knew that we're in for trouble because he kept patting me on the shoulder. <laughs> okay, David, all right. I couldn't stand anymore. I threw that thing off. I went over to him. He's just a little guy, too. I walked over to him and I said, you either take that back and apologize to Jesus or I'm going to tear into you and beat the tar out of you. All the guys in the store are saying, he's a preacher? <laughs> I said, I was never taught well. You know what? We got the most awful intimidation, fearful Christians today that we've ever had. And we're letting the government run all over us? Are you kidding? What did Peter say? Read Acts 5.29. We ought to obey God rather than man. You do what you want. Beat us up, throw us into jail, kill us, whatever you want to do. But we're not quitting. Oh, by the way, God is listening. We're not quitting. Yeah, if I were you, I'd speak up before he zaps you. So what is the true gospel? Uh, I've been asked to deliver this several places. And uh, in one church, the pastor and all the board of deacons got on their knees and confessed that their hearts were being drawn away from the Lord. It's easy. You know, some local seminary guy comes in and tells him about contemplative prayer and having stations of the cross and the emerging church, the church of the new 21st century, and it, it's tragic. Right near us is a wonderful Baptist church of 2,000 people. They lost their pa pastor. He died. They couldn't agree on one. They had a professor from a local seminary come in and tell them about the emerging church, and they went for it. In less than four months, that church went from 2,000 down to 200 people. They all sit in a circle, and they wait for the Lord to talk to them, which he usually doesn't. And it is unbelievable. Talk about stupid. Uh, I don't think we have any more. Do we have any more emerging church booklets back there? Is that it? Yeah. Well, you can order it from us. I didn't write it. My brother did. My brother was a missionary in Africa for 57 years, established one of the greatest seminaries in all of Africa, a Cameroon Biblical Seminary, where we're training pastors and teaching them the Word of God. And um, it's really interesting how Africa now has all of our junk, merging church stuff, everything. And so he... Uh, when my brother came home on furlough, he called all the chief guys in America who are emerging church guys and asked them what books he should read to understand it. They gave him four volumes. They're using as textbooks now in Christian colleges and universities. My brother's a, a very smart guy, a lot of language ability. But anyway, he wrote a book, and he said there are ten things wrong with the emerging church. And I'm telling you, you cannot believe how that, that, that little book is sold. It just, we can't keep it in print. Thousands of copies going out. Why? Because this thing is getting huge. And by the way, they're coming to Canada real strong. So if it happens in your church and neighborhood, don't be surprised. It's coming very, very strong. Okay, let's get with it. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We will begin our reading at verse 17 and read down to chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
verse 17, down to chapter 2, verse 5. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught or nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And all God's people said, Amen. let's pray. Father, we ask for your help, the help of your Holy Spirit. We desire, Lord, to speak the truth that will set us free. We grieve over what's happening to the evangelical churches of North America. Oh, God, help us. Help us to not be afraid anymore or intimidated People asking us not to say anything. God, I pray that we'll open our mouths and speak boldly, that we might recognize the seriousness of this time. For we are standing right in front of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we all look forward to it. It would be great, Lord, if we just did that after this meeting. We'd be out of here and with you forever. I pray for those that may be sitting here and are not really sure of their own relationship to you. It's so easy to hang around the Christians and go to their meetings and yet never been born again. God, I pray that you will open our hearts to the true gospel. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. What is the true gospel? Well, like we often say to our students, you find out what something is by finding out what it is not. So here we go. The true gospel is not 
a gospel of self-effort. Yet we got church after church preaching it. Listen, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We need to wake up. Churches that are telling people that, you know, you have to live the way God wants you to live. You have to have a lifestyle, a behavior pattern uh, that pleases the Lord in order to be sure you're saved. Hey, I know there's a lot of problems related to that, but I just want you to understand your self-effort and mine does not save us. There are plenty of unbelievers who look better than the believers who can program themselves to look good in their neighborhoods and families. Wake up. Here's another thing it's not. It's not self-esteem. Dr. Robert Schuler of the Crystal Cathedral was, uh, I believe, one of the most awful prophets to have ever come on the scene. He told everybody that the real theology of the New Testament was self-esteem. That unless you love, didn't love yourself, you couldn't love anybody else. That's a lie. He used to quote it and say, The Bible says, I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second is like it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. So he taught that what the text said is you have to love yourself in order to love anybody else. That is not what it said. It is a simile in Greek. It means you do love yourself. Now, all that effort you pour into yourself, pour into others. He got the whole thing messed up, and he messed up a lot of churches in the process. The judgment of God has fallen on that ministry, thank the Lord. He has a grandson that loves the Lord and is trying to pick up the pieces. They sold the property to the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic has given them two years to pay off the debt they owe them, $58 million. They'll never do it. Self-esteem? No. God tells you. He didn't tell you to love yourself. He says in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. That's a one-way trip to death. Death to our plans. Death to our agenda. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The true gospel is not a gospel of self-righteousness. And this is everywhere. It makes you sick. Really sick. You know, there are a lot of pastors who are playing a role. I had people telling me, I'm never going to make it. They said, I'm never going to make it. They said, you need to straighten up. Several things. Number one, they told me that I was a street preacher and had a bad vocabulary and didn't put words together right. They were right. But it's okay. God used Balaam's donkey. I figure he can use me. (laughs) Amen? I got so tired of people telling me, you're not going to make it, you know. So I already know that I won't make it without God's help and his supernatural power. It's so important. Well, you got to start wearing a tie. What for? That's the reason why women live longer than men. We're slowly choking to death by wearing ties. Come on, wake up. You wear ties up here because it's freezing cold. Come down to Southern California, you'll get rid of your tie. It gets hot. Amen? But you see, you don't wear a tie, and you look like the rest of the men in the church. Horror, oh Horror. What is the matter with us? It's pride, it's arrogance, trying to be something you're not. When are we going to wake up? Pastors are doing a lot of damage, my friends, by the way they act, by their attitudes, and self-righteousness dominates them. I can hear them on the television or radio. I know immediately. My wife doesn't want me to listen to that stuff because I throw pillows at the TV. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, Paul said in Romans 10, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. We have a new book out there, as I told you in the last session, on the book of Romans called The Gospel of Jesus Christ. The issue in Romans is the righteousness of God. 
And hardly everyone pre- uh, really re- will present that the way Romans presents it. Like somehow that's not quite what we need. I was just with, at a big conference and the, the uh, pastor and I, the speaker who was supposed to be speaking, got into a little argument publicly. I'm trying to give an invitation. He got up there and he said, all you have to do is believe in Jesus. How many of you want to believe in Jesus? He finished. I said, will you sit down, please? Let me handle this. And I got in front of the people. I said, that isn't going to work. There are thousands of guys down in Mexico named Jesus, and they can't save you. You better find out who we're talking about. He's the only one that can save you, the one in the Bible. And it isn't just his name or title. Jesus is an English transliteration of the Greek word, Jesus, which translates the Hebrew, Yehoshua, Yahweh of salvation. We've messed around. The word name, when reference to God, is never in the plural. It's only in the singular. 800 times in the Old Testament, the word is Shem, the name of God. There are never names of God. we got books on our Christian bookstore saying names of the Lord. Well, you might be talking about characteristics of him, but there are no other names. None. 800 times, always singular. When you come to the New Testament, the Greek word anima, the same thing. Over 200 times, always singular. Even when other persons of the triune God are mentioned. Baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One name who, who can manifest himself as Father or Son or Holy Spirit. You say, do you understand that? No, I don't. I've written about it. I've studied about it. I still continue to study it. But the fact is that it's not really Trinity, which is not a Bible word. It's not a Trinity. There aren't three gods. There's only one God. It's triunity. That's what it is. God can be more than one. After all, the same word in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Hebrew word echav, is also used in Genesis 2.24. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined or cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Yes, one can mean more than one. Does the Hebrew have one and means one and just one? No, can't be more than two. Yes, it does. Never used of God, interestingly. Okay, everybody all right? The true gospel is not a gospel of self-improvement. I was listening to one guy on the TV. He said, there's no reason why we all can't get our act together. What? I've been trying for years to get my act together. I, I haven't even got close to it. I've been preaching for 55 years now. And I still, I, I can't get it together. I don't know what's the matter. Maybe I'm, I'm not religious enough. I don't know. Self-improvement? There's none righteous, no, not one. I don't care who you are. There's none that doeth good. There is none that seeketh after God. That's the true gospel. The true gospel is not a gospel of self-recovery. Oh, they, the churches love this word, recovery. They announce that on billboards you drive by. Recovery classes, you know? Well, lots of luck, but it isn't going to work. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Are there any honest people here? Is that you? Amen? Some of you are so tired you can't lift your hand up. You haven't even started to listen. That's why you don't know what I just said. Or your hand would be up. Listen, friends, stop acting. I, you know, it was up here in Canada, over to church in, in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I was. And I was talking something similar, not this message, but different. And this man stands up while I'm preaching. And he said, I don't agree with you. I said, oh, really? I said, I'm still in my message, but go ahead, tell me where you disagree. 
He said, I have never sinned since I was born again. I don't sin at all. I started to answer it, and his wife stood up, and she said, oh, sit down. You sin every day. <laughs> yeah, they know you at home. <laughs> oh, boy, do we have one here. Self-deception. Galatian, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The true gospel, what is it? That's the issue of all issues. What is going on in our churches is unbelievable. Some men think they're so powerful that nobody can confront them. Watch out. You got a pastor like that? You better pray earnestly for him. That's the first step for that guy getting off track. It's unbelievable. I don't even like pastor meetings. I hated them. You go there, a bunch of ministers telling him. One guy said, how many did you have last week? I don't know. It's just hard to park. I don't know. People are so crazy. We never counted people. One guy came and he had a whole group of students from the school. He said, we've already counted over 12,000 here. He said, how many do you regularly have? I said, I don't know. I guess we, you know, we at least had 12,000 a day. Oh, it was more than that. I said, well, what difference does it make? Well, there are not many churches like that. People are lined up waiting to get in. I said, yeah, I know. Maybe we ought to build a bigger one. I don't know. We built the largest auditorium in Orange County. It still is the largest auditorium. All theater seats. Very comfortable. Just one problem. Uh, the first Sunday that we operated, we thought everybody could be together in this big auditorium. We had more people standing outside waiting to get in than were in the church. So I just told him, well, if you guys want to wait or go get something to eat or whatever, I'll be out here again and uh, we'll just... I wound up having four services that morning and two that night. And we did that for several years. You know what? There comes a time when you don't even know if you're a pastor. A rancher maybe, but not a pastor. You're not a shepherd. Are you kidding? How many people are going to shepherd handle? Well, if you believe Jesus, only about a hundred. That's it. And even one of them may be on, uh, bomb, bombed out and out to lunch and everything else. You've got to go get them. But the fact is, what is the true gospel and why are churches getting away from it? That's, that's my question. That's my concern. So let's start in. You've got your Bible handy. Number one. The true gospel evangelizes lost sinners. That's the true gospel. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I had a pastor call me and he said you know I heard you on the radio say you have to believe Jesus is the Messiah of Israel in order to be saved. I said yes sir I said that. Well, what proof do you have? I said, John 20, 30, and 31. Many of the things did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing that, you'll have life through his name. Listen, I don't know what Jesus you believe in, but he is the Messiah of Israel. The one who said, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For there is none other God but me. Wow. Amazing what's said. Paul wrote in Romans 5, God commendeth his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And the Greek word is reconciliation, which it was talking about. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Listen, people, the true gospel evangelizes lost sinners. One pastor told me, he said, well, I don't know when we've had a lost sinner in our church. I said, well, try looking at the crowd you have. Pastor Chuck Smith was talking to me one day about the true gospel. And he said, you know, the back third of the auditorium bothers me. I said, it bothers me too. I sat there until I couldn't stand it anymore. I got out of there. I'd rather be up front. I call that spitting range. That's where I want to be. They don't sing. They don't have their Bibles. Listen, one of the things you can do to let your church know where you stand is to carry a Bible. I'm about ready to authorize that Jerry Falwell old-time gospel hour Bible, big thing for the coffee table. I'm about ready to get people to carry that into the church and cause trouble. It's true. I was at the largest church in California, over 35,000 people. My wife and I sat outside. Everybody has to walk right by us to go out to the parking lot. We counted Bibles. We had tablets. She had one. I had one. Over 20,000 people walked in front of us. We counted three Bibles. That was it. And you don't think we have a problem? Yeah, we have a problem. I came into a restaurant, Mimi's Restaurant, down in Southern California. I go there sometime, get a little breakfast before I go to the service. It's early in the morning. I came in, and um, I like to carry my Bible with me, even to breakfast. So I came into the breakfast, and uh, I sat down at the stool. There was another guy about three stools down, and I took my Bible. I've learned how to do this, and I let it <coughs> drop, thud on the counter. He jumped. I knew then I had him. <laughs> he said, are you going to leave that there? I said, what difference does it make to you whether I leave it there or not? He said, you know what that is? I said, no, tell me what it is. He said, that's a holy Bible. <coughs> I knew he knew nothing about it. I said, you know what else it is? He said, what? It's a sword. <laughs> I went like that to him. He jumped up, called for the manager, and the manager came out and said, oh, that's just David. Don't worry about it. Number two, the true gospel exposes the inadequacy of human wisdom. Boy, we must not be preaching because we're allowing human wisdom to dominate our sermons and our teachings and our talk in church. We read here in 1 Corinthians 1, 19 to 21, it's written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Wow. If you're not preaching the true gospel, you probably enjoy here, thank you very much. I'll try not to say much about it so you can get a reward. <laughs> thank you very much. 
It amazes me how human wisdom has become a part of the evangelical message. I just don't get it. The only thing I conclude is those pastors are not reading the Bible. God doesn't want human wisdom. They tell me about the latest psychology and all the stuff they brought into the church. Remember Dave Hunt's talks on that? His book was a classic, The Seduction of Christianity. Boy, if he was still alive right now, he wouldn't believe what's happening. Or he, he would believe it because he, he wrote about it. Number three, the true gospel excels the wisdom and power of the world. This is something people don't seem to get. In 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 25, the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block, and under the Greeks, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, or called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because, listen to this carefully, and I'll try to explain it. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Excuse me, God is not foolish. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Excuse me, God is not weak. What's the point here? Well, the Greek makes it clear, a lot clearer than English. First statement is the foolish thing of God. It's in the context of the cross of Christ, preaching Christ crucified. That's a foolish thing to the Greeks and the wisdom of the world. Well, that is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is again neuter. The weak thing of God is stronger than men. How true that is. May God help us to understand. And there it is again. Number four, what is the true gospel? The true gospel excludes human performance or personal worth as a basis for salvation. Several years ago, I was talking with a lady who was always concerned about her children coming to know the Lord, which was a good concern. And she said about her little boy, who's turned out to be quite a trumpet player, and she said, I just know God's going to save him. God has gifted him as a trumpet player. I know God's going to want to have him. You know, my problem is I should just not open my mouth. Just say, okay, yeah, God, praise the Lord. No, what I said to her was, I don't think God needs another trumpet player. She was horrified. What? I said, no, he's got plenty of them. Got a bunch of angels up there. They can really blow. <laughs> and she said, how could you say that? I said, very easy. You see, God is not going to choose your boy because he's a good trumpet player. Oh, but he's such a wonderful boy. You know, out of all our children, he's really special. Well, I'm glad you think that, but that isn't the reason God's going to choose him either. In fact, I don't even know if God's going to choose him. But let's suppose he is. According to the Bible, you've been chosen before the foundation of the world. He said, why would God do that? I said, well, I can think of one reason. That's so we won't mess it up. He made the decision before we were born. I love the way you're looking. Some of you are saying, Martha, is this guy right here or what's going on? Are you kidding what are you, a Calvinist? Isn't that Presbyterian stuff? Are you kidding? It's the Bible. God chose you before you were ever born if you were chosen by God. Why? So that he would be exalted, not you. So that you would every day of your life thank God that in his grace and mercy he reached down and saved your rotten soul. What is the matter with us? The true gospel is not being preached. 
There it is in 1 Corinthians 27. I love this. God has chosen the foolish things of the world. You know what the word foolish is? It's the Greek word moronos, from which we get the English moron. Welcome to the body of Christ, a bunch of morons. And then it says he's uh, chosen the weak things of the world. That's austenos, which means you have no ability whatsoever. He didn't choose you because your ability. Are you kidding? No. And, and it goes on to just lay it out. He chose the base things of the world. That means you're worthless. Yeah. And things which are despised, nobody really likes you. The things which are not, you're absolutely nothing. Why? So that he will receive all the glory. Praise the Lord. I had a guy call me on a phone. I remember 35 years ago, we got into a fight on a high school campus, and I beat the tar, tar out of him. It felt good, too. Anyway, uh, he called me on a phone. He said, I just heard on radio, and they said your name, and you were the preacher. He said, I can't believe it. He said, do you remember 35 years ago? I said, oh, yeah. And immediately, you know what I did? You talk about carnality in the pulpit. I immediately prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, please, not him. I know him. He's not very good. You don't want to have him in the fellowship of... You know, I later not only led him to Christ, but had to baptize him. And I told him when I baptized him, I really don't want to let you up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carnality's everywhere, isn't it? How about this one? The true gospel, praise God, exalts Jesus Christ as our only hope. There is nothing else. Your faith does not save you. Jesus Christ saves you. We got this all wrong. People say to me, all, oh, I sure hope I have enough faith to believe. Well, give it up. You don't need it anyway. Faith needs an object. The word is pistis in Greek or pistuo, or the verb. And it demands an object. It has to have an object. I think the best and simplest illustration is a chair. If I ask you, uh, do you believe that chair can hold you up? If you've watched it enough, you say, yeah, I think so. You can stand all day saying, I think the chair can hold me up. That is not saving faith. That is intellectual agreement to certain facts that are available to you. But that is not the faith of the New Testament. The chair represents Jesus Christ in the illustration. It isn't your faith or your ability to believe it. It's Jesus Christ himself. And the more you know about him, the less you care about yourself anymore. Don't you get it? You stop bragging about yourself. You stop thinking about, boy, God must be blessed to have me in his kingdom. Are you kidding? Take a look in the mirror. It's a miracle, believe me. Number six, the true gospel eliminates any dependency upon human ability or methods. I, I really enjoy this particular point. In chapter 2 here of 1 Corinthians, verses 1 to 4, there are three things here about this. And we need every, especially those who are teaching God's word and preaching, we need to understand it. Number one, it includes our presentation of the message. It came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Wow. It doesn't include that. Boy, we, know, we need to have uh, Pastor X here. Boy, I'll tell you, he can really dish it out. Excuse me. In 1976, I was in Korea for the revivals. And um, I preached six times a day, every day for two weeks, the thousands and thousands of those precious Koreans. The very first time I was preaching, I remembered it was Sunday night. And there was over 20,000 people in that stadium. And I was introduced, I came up, I had an interrupter, you know, interpreter. And... Um, I started in, and all of a sudden, people just kept pouring down the aisle. And I turned to him, and I said, what's going on? He said, oh, well, this has been going on for days. 
this is a true revival of the Holy Spirit. I said, well, I haven't preached my message. He said, it's not needed. <laughs> hey, what? It's not needed. Why don't you just help me with these folks that are coming down here in droves. The same thing happened to me in Modesto in the 80s. A real revival happened in Modesto, California. Strangest thing. It was a little drama group who were preaching about hell. It was amazing. Remember that? Wow. I was invited to come up and speak to the men of the city. Several thousand of them. And I started to preach and all of a sudden these men just flowed down the aisles. Many of them falling on their face and crying their hearts out. And the same thing. And I turned to the music guy and I said, what's going on? He said, this is what's going on in Modesto. The Holy Spirit of God is at work. You see, it isn't dependent on how the meeting went. <laughs> how the pr presentation of the message, you know. I've seen some of the greatest presentations do nothing. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. And I've seen some that got so mixed up. One guy, I'll never forget all the people that came to know the Lord. He got mixed up. He was fairly new. And he started with the end, the last point of his message, because he couldn't remember how he got there. You know, it was really funny. And God just began to work like crazy. And talk about a messed up message, but God can do it. Yeah, he can do it. It's not only that, but it includes our personality in front of people. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. There are audiences like that all over the world. I've been there. I felt like nothing. But you know, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that works within us. You want to know why the churches are having trouble? They kiss the Holy Spirit goodbye. You listen to me. I'm not talking about tongues or any of that junk. I'm not talking about that. The Bible teaches the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came from the lips of Jesus was power for witness. And with much power, those who were filled with the Holy Spirit preached the gospel. What's happened in your church? Did the power go out the window? I noticed the association of power in the book of Acts with all those prayer meetings. Where I'm teaching now at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California. It's interesting. We have nine prayer meetings every week. We don't have a meeting. I don't get up to preach on Tuesday nights without having prayer. So we meet in a prayer room, a whole bunch of people. Pray that the power of God will be there. You know, it's amazing what's happened. I just started four weeks ago. I had no idea what God wanted to do. The pastor asked me to speak on Isaiah. I've done that before. But I have not looked at my notes or my book that I wrote on it, nothing. I just asked the Lord to give me a fresh look at Isaiah. We need prayer. You want to see God work, we need prayer. That happens to be broadcast on K-Wave, which is the largest radio station in Southern California, every Tuesday night live. They also much to the glory of God, decided to put me on internet television all around the world, 193 countries, live. We got calls from Europe and the Middle East, all over the world, people staying up late because we're only Pacific Standard Time. It's unbelievable. And I've watched God move on people's lives. We've had scores and scores of people turning to the Lord. Listen, folks, I'm not here for my health.
I don't know what it's going to take, but we better straighten out our churches. We're a long ways from God. And it also involves our persuasion of people to believe the message. It isn't me persuading the audience. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God, the incorruptible seed. And people believe what God said, and the Holy Spirit brings them to the Lord. My speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The true gospel, my friends, I give this to you for the last point. The true gospel establishes faith in Jesus Christ alone as the only means of salvation. It isn't your faith that saves you. It's Jesus Christ that saves you. My Lord is alive. He's not dead. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. Two men in white apparel may not be angels, may be Moses and Elijah again. But two men said there, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Peter, what happened to him? He denied the Lord and yet after Pentecost, things are different. And Peter said in front of the Sanhedrin, neither is there salvation in any other for there's none other their name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The true gospel. That's what our churches need desperately. 